take a few minutes for all of our microphones to get unmuted here, but after that everybody will be hearing everything that goes on as we're preparing to go live on uh, this second webinar in the Red Tail Squadron's effort to promote the awareness of the Tuskegee Airmen. And uh, Charles, we're very excited to have you um, connected positively this time. And, uh, Thank you. Just verify that uh, on a live computer that this is going to come out. So if we can get a, a brief statement from Charles to verify his connection, that would be wonderful. Glad to be on board, and I think it's working. Wonderful. And uh, Dr. Brown, we have you as well, and let's give a test of your audio connection if we could, please. Just fine. Hear you loud and clear. Fantastic. It sounds like some of the questions are already coming in, and we have uh, 19 people of the 500 signed on so far. So um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to begin to grow organically in very short order here as we approach our official start time. Um, any particular topics you gentlemen would like to cover? Uh, Colonel McGee, since we, we uh, missed out on a lot of your insights on the last webinar, anything in particular you'd like to make sure we cover this time? And I'll make some notes as, as you go ahead. And let well, us know what. Yeah, I would just state that uh, folks need to know that uh, the facts of the movie are good, the story, it's not a documentary, so they may take some license, but we can answer those questions and uh, hope everyone enjoys it as much as I have. Wonderful. And Colonel Brown, any comments um, as we begin this thing on topics you'd like to make sure we cover in this episode? <laughs> no, just have at it. Uh, we covered an awful lot of material last time, so whenever they're ready. I agree. We're can ready both to of, respond. Perfect. Can both of you read the questions that are being typed in on the uh, chat panel? Nothing has shown up on mine yet. It's got a question and ask her. But uh, is that the question that's coming in on the blue panel on the uh, Wikipedia? Correct. There's okay, now then Ralph is on right, right now. Okay. Someone Why? call Ralph. Right. Mine okay, who like, served under uh, General Ben, General Davis, and so forth, when he was in the 13th Air Force. And it looks like this question was: Is was Colonel Ballard in the movie actually playing the part representing uh, General Davis, uh, who was a squadron commanding officer at that time? Any any comments on that before we really get this thing underway? Hmm. No, I think that, that 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 was the case. He was playing the role of uh, of Colonel Davis. Uh, I think that, was, that way. We had a couple of people questioning last time. We obviously didn't get to all of the questions because we were really inundated and then uh, working to resolve the technical issues, which we seem to have under great control this time. Uh, but. Some of the people wanted to know why, uh, in your opinion, um, uh, Mr. Lucas and the film producers eliminated actual names and people in favor of characters. Now, my suspicion is we didn't want to omit anyone by, um, uh, by only naming a few of the, uh, the original Tuskegee Airmen in the film, uh, but wanted to present more of a broad picture of the uh, of the characters and the indi and the group effort, rather than highlighting specific individuals, mm -hmm. that's accurate. That, that was the effort. It was to uh, it's a composite, and they did not want to name individuals. It's not a documentary. In a documentary, they would have named individuals. Here, they gave fictitious names, and you can make some assumptions if you choose. Yeah, I think it would have been uh, perhaps a more appropriate if they would have least have named uh, B.O. Davis and uh, and maybe one other, but no more than that. Uh, and I would have been very comfortable, you know. Certainly. If he just, you know, just identified and the fact that he was playing B.O. Davis and uh, used that name. Uh, but, no, but no other name should have been used. The, the problem... The problem with using an actual name when it's not a documentary affects the story because everything in the way they presented it to make it a movie 
isn't exactly how that person may have uh, performed. For instance, in the movie, they have a squadron commander who happens to be the drinker. That may not be. Did we have a drinker somewhere? Yes. Did we have a squadron commander who was doing the drinking? I'm not aware of it. I'm not aware of it either. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, let me take a brief moment to thank the people who have joined us early. We, um, we are broadcasting. We uh, wanted to make sure that we could iron out any technical glitches beforehand. So for those of you who have already signed in, welcome. Thank you for joining us early. We've got a little extra bonus feature in the uh, rolling live presentation here so that you can take advantage of some of the, uh, the preparations as we get ready to go live in, in about nine minutes. So stay with us, and by all means, we'd like to uh, invite you to uh, share with your friends and colleagues the, uh, the sign-on information at tinyurl.com slash redtailwebinar2. That's the one we're starting today. We have Colonel McGee and uh, Colonel Brown on the line with us, and we're grateful for their participation. If I can ask if uh, some of the people who have signed in now can type in a uh, kind of a, a rating of the audio quality, we appreciate getting some feedback now as we're getting ready to go live on how it sounds on the, on the systems you're receiving us on. So take a moment. Feel free to bounce in any comments on the audio quality or any of the other issues. And uh, by all means, keep your questions coming and invite all your friends to join us. We still have about eight minutes before we're scheduled to begin our official broadcast and uh, would like to again thank you for joining us early and welcome you all aboard. Uh, Sterling says the sound is great and very clear. Thank you, Sterling. We appreciate that and uh, we hope it continues as such through the rest of the broadcast. We're excited to have you on board here. Um, let's see. And gentlemen, Colonel McGee and, uh, and Colonel Brown, if you can scroll back up to the uh, the top of the question list here, we've got one um, from Bill Zuck who asks, let's see, this thing keeps bouncing around as I try to read the question, so I'll try and stay with you, Bill. The question is, there's been a lot of controversy among film critics that the Tuskegee Airmen story was not told faithfully and resorted to dramatic license. Uh, feel free to comment on that, gentlemen. And what was the question again? We well, the, the question reverts back to the Colonel McGee's comments about uh, the um, uh, the characterizations and the generalizations, rather than it becoming a documentary effort. Uh huh. I think that's a valid question. Why did they use uh, fictitious names and nicknames instead of the actual actual names of uh, the historic figures? Hmm. So, Colonel McGee, I think you addressed that briefly. Well, I have absolutely no comment on it, really. And, and why it was done, I don't know, unless it was like Colonel McGee suggested earlier, that this was not a documentary. This was a movie. And, uh, of course, and if it was a movie, there's an awful lot of prerogatives that the producer and director is going to have in that presentation. So, whatever reason... You know that they chose to do it that way. That's you true. Know. There's there's so many ways you can tell a story, and they go to script writers and they accepted the story that that you see in the movie. We could all say, well, if they'd asked me, I might have said do it this way. Um, so there's a lot of prerogative in, involved here uh, in the nature of this this type of movie, trying to portray actual incidents and so on in a non-documentary format. I hope that answers the question the person is asking. I think it does, and as you can see in the comment section here, the question section here, it says, Bubba says hi, and he hears you all five by five, so that's great news. Um, Harold, your, your brother Larry is joining us, and... Uh, well, uh, good. He's going to be with us for the duration, I hope. And uh, Bubba, we all are thinking of you and wishing you the best, and uh, can't wait to get you back into the uh, into the working world with the rest of the Red Tail heroes here. We really appreciate all you've done through the years, and look forward to much more good things from you. So, thanks for joining us. We're about five minutes away from the official start, and um, looking forward to that. By the way, 
Feel free to, uh, let's see, Bill Zuck asked another question. Can you compare the Red Tails with the earlier HBO program, Tuskegee Airmen? Colonel no. McGee, do you have any comments on the comparison between the new film from Lucasfilms and the original HBO film? Well, besides probably the cost of doing it in the combat scenes, there there is some differences. Again, the other was a partial documentary, but not 100% even there. So um, you have to toss a coin there on, on what is it you want. And, and certainly, I think any writer would not please everybody that wants to uh, hear the story or see it in movie. Well, it's kind of interesting. When you go back to the HBO movie, uh, uh, the uh, executive director, Bob Williams, happened to be my classmate in Class 44E. And HBO allotted them a budget of about $10 million to do that HBO movie. And of course, with $10 million, you are very limited as what you can even do. And uh, you know, Bob told me that uh, many of the scenes in which they had the P-51 sitting out in the field were nothing more but cardboard mock-ups. Mm -hmm. And they only had a few live airplanes. And uh, they certainly didn't have the advantage of a large animation uh, uh, department the way Lucas had uh, that, you know, animation department. and. With that, there's so much that you can create. So uh, they didn't have any at all. So they were forced to use nothing but just two or three live aircraft. And with those few number of aircraft, there's no way in the world you're going to portray all the dog fighting and whatnot that went on. And I think the only way that it could have been done was the way that Lucas did it, was to just uh, animate it, the well, thing. and. It certainly worked out better as far as I'm concerned because with animation you can make the dog fight as wild as you want to make it. And Absolutely. since this is an action type movie, uh, you will want it to be wild and a little bit on the other side. Because uh, I would think that a regular ordinary dog fight wouldn't be near as much fun to watch as the way he portrayed it in animation. So let's make sure that we re revisit this topic um, in detail once we go live here in about a minute and a half. Uh, I think the audience would love to hear more details about the actual combat uh, scenarios with the dogfight playing out and contrast that with the way it was portrayed on the screen. A couple of years ago, I was fortunate enough with, with Brad Lang, the, uh, the squadron leader from the Red Tail Squadron, to share a dinner with uh, Mr. McCallum and uh, Thomas Knoll, the head of the, uh, the computer graphics team for this Red Tails movie. And uh, we're very excited to have had that opportunity. And um, it, was, it was a pretty interesting evening there, I'll tell you that. It was, it was really neat to sit down with the guy who produced the Star Wars trilogy and, uh, and the gentleman who is basically invent the lead inventor on the Photoshop software program that's become so prominent. We're about one minute away. and. Uh, for those of you who are already online and uh, joining us ahead of the official start to this program, I would like to ask if when you email us questions, please include your name and your city, the location you're writing from, in the body of your question so that it's faster and easier for us to get that online and we can acknowledge uh, the broad audience that we have here. And um, my clock shows straight up on the hour. And I would like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to this second in a series of broadcasts detailing the original Tuskegee Airmen. And uh, on behalf of the Commemorative Air Force Red Tail Squadron, I want to thank you all for joining us. This program was recorded live on February 4, 2012. I'm your moderator, Stan Ross. And as we begin to introduce our special guests on this program, I would like to give you all a moment to collect a pen and paper so that you can make notes on some of the information that will be visible on the screen. On the screen right now, you'll see a welcome panel that uh, shows the pictures of the two best-looking people I've ever had the pleasure to meet, Colonel Charles McGee and Colonel Harold Brown of the Tuskegee Airmen. 
And I would like to ask you all to please send out a quick email and um, invite friends, family, and uh, interested parties, especially people from the educational side of life, the school kids especially, to join us at the web address that is shown there, tinyurl.com slash redtailwebinar2. And um, we're going to begin by giving you a real brief introduction. I, we assume people already know the, uh, the background information on Colonel McGee and Colonel Brown, but uh, let me give you a brief rundown. Colonel McGee was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and spent his childhood there, as well as in Illinois and Iowa. He was a member of the 302nd Fighter Squadron in Italy during World War II, and flew many, many other aircraft, and served in uh, three wars, uh, World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam, and had an incredibly distinguished career with the, uh, with the Air Force. And we'll get more details from him about that as well, and uh, we'll make every effort to get to all of the questions today. Colonel Harold Brown was born in Minneapolis. We're proud to claim him as our native son here in Minnesota, and was raised in Minneapolis and graduated from North High School and, uh, in 1942, and uh, became a a pilot and graduated from class 44E of the Tuskegee Airmen. And thereafter was a member of the 332nd Fighter Group and completed 30 missions before being shot down and captured. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing more details. And um, also want to actually thank these gentlemen for being involved with the Red Tail Squadron from our very beginning. Uh, they, Colonel McGee and Colonel Brown joined two other original Tuskegee Airmen as members of our board of directors, Dr. Roscoe Brown and the late great Colonel Lee Archer. I also want to mention that uh, our original spokesperson for the Red Tail Squadron was none other than Lena Horn, and we are very, very grateful for her participation early on and uh, all of the efforts that she made. Without further ado, let's get to the questions. and. Um, Thank you both for joining us, Colonel McGee and Colonel Brown. Colonel McGee, could we start out with a little, little bit of your um, comments about the accuracy of the new George Lucas film, Red Tails? Yes, I'd be glad to, and thanks for the kind introduction there. You might tell folks we didn't pay you to say that. <laughs> um, this movie is based on facts but it is not a documentary, so the script writers and the folks that try to make something uh, that people will enjoy, and again, again, they're looking at the whole realm of the those that would attend the theater, have put together a story that uh, uh, we might say that this is such and such a person, or some of the things in it such and such a person did accomplish, but, but it is a story to get over some facts, but not necessarily written in the way that those facts actually happened in time, um, sequence, or, or location. Uh, and it's a matter of, of cost. Uh, that Lucas has brought together the story, I say, of the first squadron, the 99th Pursuit Squadron, and that of the 332nd Fighter Group, the three squadrons that followed, and uh, put them together. Well, certainly there's going to be some things that aren't like they would be if it were a documentary. So it's pretty broad, and the writers, I guess you'd say they have the privilege of, of doing what they did. Absolutely. And I would invite both of our special guests, Colonel Charles McGee and Colonel Harold Brown, to take a look at the chat line and feel free to respond directly to some of the questions that are appearing there. For example, this one from Maxine Walker Giddings. And she says, I understand there was a black woman married to one of the Tuskegee Airmen who was an expert pilot herself. Due to the prejudice of the time, she was not allowed to join the WAX or fly for the U.S. military. I believe she's referring to Mildred Hemmons Carter, who actually on the date of our last broadcast, February 1st, uh, that was the 71st anniversary of her becoming the first black woman in Alabama to earn her pilot certificate. I noticed that she was very, very proudly credited as one of the technical advisors in the film. Um, Herb Carter's wife, Mildred Hemmons Carter, was a very prominent aviator in her own right, 
Uh, did any of you, either of you gentlemen, happen to have the pleasure of meeting Mrs. Carter? Yeah, I've known uh, Gene and his wife for many, many years. Gene and Mildred, very good friends. Uh, and yes, she uh, suffered what prejudice meant in that day that she was denied her opportunity to serve the government and our country in time of war just because of her happenstance of birth. But she didn't give up on flying and flew great many years of her life, and unfortunately we lost her very recently. Colonel Brown, did you have a No, I never had the pleasure of, uh, of uh, meeting the lady. All right, one other question now from LaDonna James of Egan, Minnesota, who comments that she's had the pleasure of meeting Colonel McGee several times at Air Venture in Oshkosh. Her question is, were there any actual combat film sequences of uh, actual Tuskegee Airmen battle scenes used in the film. Are you aware of that, gentlemen? I'm not aware of them uh, going into the uh, military archives and using. There are some uh, products out that, that, that use actual film from those days, but I think uh, George Lucas has put together a complete story without doing that. John Tenuto writes in, uh, thank you for your service, and can you tell us about some of the requirements to be considered for the Tuskegee Airmen flight program? Well, as far as I know, the standards for a cadet um, weren't changed because of this uh, first experiment and then the follow-on in the continued training at Tuskegee. To, we met the same training standards that were uh, part of the Southeast Flying Training Command. Um, folks, some may not realize that in the very early start of it, uh, to enter the pilot program, you had to have a college degree. Well, by war's end, you could become a pilot with just a high school di diploma. Uh, so times did change, but uh, the selections, uh, and I'm sure there were many who could be were good pilots that, that uh, didn't make it through the Tuskegee program. We weren't called Tuskegee Airmen, if you realize, in the early days. Um, that's a name that stuck uh, after we look at history and, and say what happened. Bill Helms from Cheyenne, Wyoming, sends a question. Did they, did they actually fly P-40s prior to the P-51s? Colonel Brown, could you perhaps uh, spend a moment talking about the aircraft that you trained in and flew during the, uh, both the training period and in combat? Well, uh, once, you, once you completed your, your advanced training, uh, then you transition in the fighters. Uh, that was all done with the with the P-40. Um, I think in America, something like 15, 20 hours you've got in that P-40 is all part of the transition. Then you went into fighter training. Uh, I, in my case, uh, the 332nd was already overseas, and I went down to Wallaboro, and I flew the P-47 down in Wallaboro for oh, something close to about 60 hours as part of my fighter training. But they did that because uh, the 332nd had been transferred over the Ramatelli, and they had been assigned to fly the, uh, and they had been assigned to fly the, uh, the P-47. But that, but they only kept the P-47 for no more than, uh, than about a month or so about 30-some days or so, and then they went into the P-51. So even though I flew it for 60 hours down there, then when I went overseas, uh, uh, I wasn't even current in the airplane they were flying. So I had to then check out in the, uh, in the P-51, which is what they were flying at the time that I arrived, which was in... Uh, which was back in uh, October of 1944. So uh, I don't know if that is uh, responsive to the question or not, but uh, 
That was that my sounds case. like a terrific response. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to take a moment to ask the, uh, the rest of the panelists to make sure that the volume is turned down on your computers that you may be using at home. We're getting a little bit of audio feedback, and I'd like to make sure that we present our listeners with real clear soundtrack as well. And remind you all that this is being presented by the Commemorative Air Force Red Tail Squadron, a volunteer-driven organization dedicated to telling the, the real story the real of the story of the airmen. And uh, we are very grateful today to have Charles McGee and Colonel Harold Brown join us to relate their their real experiences in World War II and beyond. So um, if any of you are uh, in a position and appreciate what we're doing, there's a uh, an opportunity for you to donate and help support our educational mission at, um, by your, your uh, cell phone only. And it's really very easy to type red tail, send the text red tail to the phone number that will appear on your screen shortly and that will result in a small $10 donation that is seamless, painless and will be very, very, uh, very much appreciated here. So there's the information on the screen now. If you'd like to contribute, make a small dollar gift, you can simply text red tail to 20222 on your cell phone and we'd be grateful if you would. Colonel McGee. Colonel McGee. Yes, ma'am. In between missions, what did we do for, for relaxation? What did we do for what? For relaxation. How did you spend your time between the missions and the sorties that your your team was Well, doing? our relaxation was we weren't that far from the Adriatic Sea, and you might get a chance to go down and stick your foot in the water. But uh, under segregation, we had overseas uh, the rest camp for officers pilots was on the Isle of Capri. Unfortunately, we now known as Tusky Airmen never got to the Island of Capri. We ended up having to have a, find a villa in the hills overlooking Naples Harbor. And we went on to have, and generally, uh, you could get uh, five days recreation after a few months there in the theater. Um, and later, when Rome was an open city, you could get three days in Rome. I know I like the five days better than just three, so I never got to Rome at that time. And let me add to, to the question that was asked on on training. I came through a little ahead of uh, Harold. I was in class 43F. We got a few hours in the P40, which the 99th was then flying over in Africa, in Sicily. Um, we were combat ready in our training in the P-40, and they said, oh, we're changing your mission. And we retransitioned into the P-39 Bell Air Cobra. And we still left the States on schedule and got into Italy in uh, January of 44. And while the 99th was still flying interdiction with then the 79th fighter group, we were flying patrol of Naples Harbor and the waterways up to Anzil Beachhead in the P-39. When the group was picked to join 15th Air Force and become a part of the escort services, that's when we, we gave the P-39 to the Russians. We picked up P-47 Thunderbolts flew a little over, I think it was like by late April of 44, first of July is when we got the P-51. Those transitions took place in combat and we need to salute our mechanics because they didn't have time to go to school neither do we pilots. We read the tech order, sat in the aircraft, found where the switches were and we were in combat. Of all the aircraft you flew in uh, World War II, Colonel McGee, what was, it, what was one that, that served you best? What did you enjoy flying on? Well, the P-47 was a great, a large cockpit, very roomy, eight guns, that was good. But that big radial nose limited the altitude and range of the aircraft, so getting in the P-51 Mustang was a real thrill because we had greater speed, greater range, greater altitude capability, and that proved especially good for escorting B-17s groups. Um, but but it was a premier fighter at the time, so, and I have to put a caveat on that. P-51 with the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, 
the early Allison engine wasn't quite well, it was a tough one to keep tuned up, wasn't supercharged quite as well. Well, from my, yeah, from my perspective, P-51 was it. That was probably the finest fighter in the world at the time. And uh, obviously, the choice of all of us was the 51. Wonderful. Mary Kankush. I'm sorry, go ahead. What's the question? I'm sorry, I, I think I, you often interrupted. I just wanted to share a comment that I think everyone who's listening uh, can agree with Mary Kenkush from Indiana, right? She just wants to thank you gentlemen for your service and um, I think we all would agree with that. We're very grateful to have had the dedication of the Tuskegee Airmen uh, during the war and after the war. Thanks to her for that kind comment. What's the most powerful memory each of you has from your World War II experience? Mm, with respect to what? Uh, can you be a little more specific? Well, when you think back to the time you spent in Europe fighting for this country, what really stands out in your memory as a, as a really strong event or episode that that you recall frequently? Well, uh, I will, well, I'll respond first. Uh, uh, you know, when I came in the military, I only had one goal. I was uh, graduated from flying school. I was 19 years old. Uh, politically, I wasn't that astute. Uh, my whole reason for even going into the military was very, very simply, I wanted to fly aircraft. That was my primary goal, and that was all I ever thought of. Uh, and I never really took it beyond that point. Uh, it wasn't until later on in my life that I really started gaining some insight as to the significance of what we had really accomplished. But, uh, but during the war and whatnot, I was a pilot. That was my goal, and I have fulfilled my goals uh, by becoming that military uh, pilot. And uh, never did I really think politically or what kind of an impact we were making on, in terms of anything other than flying aircraft. Now, some of the older guys may have had a different perspective. And, uh, of course, they probably had a little different experience than I had. And being a little older and whatnot, uh, they had probably had uh, been touched by segregation much more than I was. Me being born and raised up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where we were less than one half of one percent, the black population up there, um, I, I didn't go through any of uh, some of the experiences of guys that were born and raised down in the southern part of our country. So my perspective was just completely different from, say, some guy who was raised down in Alabama, Georgia, or, or in Mississippi. I would kind of agree. I think everyone came from a little different approach. I myself uh, came, I hadn't aspired to be a pilot. In fact, uh, my first touching an aircraft was that first flight in a PT-17. But our country had gone to war, and every, it was, I, you might say, uh, a bit of loyalty that everybody had to want to participate some kind of way whether you were getting a job in the industry and the war buildup that, that helped out many after we coming out of 10 years of depression. Um, but, but the country, there was a draft program. I had a draft card. Um, I learned in ROTC what being a ground pounder might be like. And when I heard of the opportunity to, to get into aviation, I said, let me try that. And after the first flight, I knew I'd made the right decision. But but there was an unwritten, if you will, bit of loyalty on the part of blacks as well as anybody else to serve our country 
that had declared war against Hitler. It's an admirable, an admirable <laughs> effort to go to, to go to fight for a country that treats you as poorly as, as people were treated back in the day. Um, we have a couple of questions that are very, very similar. Uh, one from Winnipeg, Canada, and another one from one of our young listeners today. Zachary, six years old, from Greenwood, Indiana, wants to know, what was it like to be captured during World War II, and how were you treated by the Germans? Well, since I was shot down and captured, uh, I guess I can respond to that one. Uh, uh, when I was shot down and brought back uh, to that little village we had been strafing, uh, I was almost in a state of shock, to be quite honest with you. Uh, the, the thought occurred to me, what in the world am I doing in this little village up in Germany with this black face and a war going on? And for just a short while, I, it was just a little difficult for me to really accept, Harold, you are in a heap of trouble. And whether you like it or not, uh, you are now a, a person who is now up in Germany in a place that you would rather not be in. And uh, uh, from that point on, uh, I didn't know what was going to happen. I couldn't speak the language. I couldn't understand anything. Uh, was I scared to death? Yes, I was scared to death. And uh, the thought occurred to me that... Uh, if I get out of this alive, it's going to take uh, a whole lot of help from somebody. And fortunately, uh, there was an old constable there who came around because they had picked out the most perfect hanging tree. And they were walking me down to it. And it was perfectly clear what they had in their mind. Now. If you think we had just strafed shrapnel flying all over the place, I might have killed some guy's mother, his sweetheart, or, or what have you, which was not our intention, but it most certainly could have happened. And then here I come floating down in a parachute. Well, those 25 or 30 people who met me as they walked me back into the village were very, very angry people. And understandably, they would be very, very angry people. But they're this constable came up, rifle, put a gun on the people, kept them away from me. We backed up into a little pub. We barricaded ourselves in it. And I often thought, boy, this guy had saved my life, which I didn't occur to me at the time. But later on in life, I thought, Cheryl, you, know, you ought to go back and find that guy because he saved your life. And he had to know every one of those people in that village. But yet, and still, he held a rifle on him, and he uh, prevented them from uh, from hanging me. So, you know, there it is. And that is the way it was when I was shot down. A frightened little 19, 20-year-old kid who felt he had no business up in Germany, which I did not. And here I found myself in a situation about to lose my life until someone came along and saved my life. You know, there were 32 uh, airmen who became POWs. And the story the others have told is, too, that their treatment in the prison camps, the Germans did abide by the Geneva Convention. So there was no segregated action and treatment, or they weren't treated any different than any of the other prison, prisoners of war. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I uh, I jokingly remake the, make the remarks that uh, uh, the first time that I was integrated was after I was shot down and I was a POW. <laughs> That's a heck of a way to come to justice, isn't it? Quite remarkable. Um, Colonel Brown, if we can ask you to take a moment, please, and try and get the audio turned down, uh, volume on your computer. appears to be continuing to cause a little bit feedback we think it's coming from your end of the line and it would make it more pleasant I can hear an awful lot of feedback coming back in 
Well, we'll keep we'll troubleshooting that if we can resolve that. And um, we have another question from a young listener named Nikki, who loves learning about the Tuskegee Airmen since seeing the Red Tails film. And he asks a really interesting question. Can you please explain what you named your airplanes and what meaning it had for you? Uh, Colonel McGee, could we start with you on this one? Yep, I, my aircraft I named Kitten. That happened to be my wife's nickname, Kitten. But I also painted on both sides because my crew chief was keeping that engine purring like a kitten. Um, I was very fortunate in uh, 54 strategic missions. I had only one early return. Our mechanics did a great job. But that was the nickname I had on the plane. Of course, when I came home after 11 months overseas, somebody else flew the plane. So during Harold's time, a different pilot was flying kitten. But uh, some had names that kicked back to what was going on in society. Uh, some had very interesting names. Uh, that uh, So there was a whole realm of types of names put on the plane. There might have been a few that didn't do anything, though. Well, I didn't name my aircraft. Uh, I had thought about it, and uh, I was trying to come up with some clever idea to name it something or other, and unfortunately, I never came up with a name. So uh, the aircraft that I was assigned, A-32, uh, was flying around without a name on it. And uh, the day I bailed out at old A-32, uh, it went down without a name on it. So, nope, I never named my aircraft. Very interesting. We have a question from Alice Brown, towards Harold. Uh, she asks, can you tell the story about the Jewish kid you met while you were in jail? <laughs> uh, Joe would ask that question. Uh, after I was shot down, uh, they, they walked me down to a little village and another little village, and eventually I wound up. Uh, in a small jail in another village, which is several kilometers down the road. And I was there by myself for a couple of days. And then I heard a large mission go over. And uh, at the time it did, I thought, boy, I just might have some company. And what happened about uh, 11 midnight or so, in comes 10 walleye guys who had bailed out of their bombers they had been rounded up, and they came in looking wild eye, not, not knowing what. Of course, you can imagine, they had first successfully bailed out. Now they're captured, and now they're lined up in a little, into a little jail. And I can imagine just about how I looked when I saw what those guys looked like. So 10 of them came in, and uh, there were three cells there, and they divided the guys up into these three little cells. So... I was there, and the guys walk in, they look at me, and they said, uh, are you a pilot? Yeah, I'm a pilot. Yeah, I'm wearing wings. Uh, well, what's going on? It's me. I don't speak German. I have the slightest idea what's going on. So this one little kid came up and said, uh, you know, I am really nervous about this thing. Uh, I said, well, what's the matter? He says, uh, I'm Jewish. I said, you're Jewish, well, all you got to do is just keep your mouth shut and nobody will ever know, know that you're Jewish. He says, oh, I said, now you don't have a problem. i got a problem because I can't hide myself. And the guy said, oh, geez, I'm sorry, girl, I'm sorry. And then I bust out laughing. I said, no, I'm only kidding and whatnot. All you got to do is keep your mouth shut and they'll never know who you are. I only wish I was in the same fix. Impressive stories. These are amazing tales from the original Tuskegee Airmen. We're very grateful for their participation, as we are for your participation in this amazing event. And uh, thank you again on behalf of the Commemorative Air Force and the Red Tail Squadron, your sponsor for this event. I'm scrolling back through the uh, questions here, looking for that one from Harlingen, Texas, the original home of the Commemorative Air Force. And uh, once I find it, I'll certainly read it. But uh, bear with me as we try and get to that question. Um, here's a, 
a latecomer calling in from Columbus, Ohio, asking, have they talked about their participation in the gathering of Mustangs and Legends a few years ago in Columbus, Ohio? Colonel McGee, could you reflect for us on your participation in that great event? In, and in the air at one time, and just the gathering of folks that love Mustangs, uh, it was a great show and, and a great opportunity to share with folks that have that common interest, whether you're the pilot of the plane or the mechanic of it, or just like the looks of it and wanted to be around. Uh, that, that was a great, great event uh, indeed. Well, I only spent a couple of days down there. Uh, I went down on a, a Friday uh, uh, and uh, spent the day primarily looking at all of the beautiful P-51s that were that were flying in, and uh, so I didn't really participate that much into it. But they did have a number of guys, a uh, number of Tuskegee guys, came in from all over the country. And uh, they must have had, oh, a nice contingent, must have been 25, 30, 30 old uh, red-tailed pilots there. Uh, but unfortunately, um, I was not there to uh, participate in it. Uh, William Pinckney, uh, and I'm not sure where William is from, asks if General Daniel Chappie James was a member of the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II. Yes, Chappie James. When I, this is McGee speaking, when uh, I started my cadet training, he was a civilian instructor in Tuskegee Institute's civilian pilot training program. Uh, somewhere there in 1943, they gave the civilian instructors an option to come on active duty. I think they made them warrant officers, and that didn't go over well, and they said, well, you go back as civilian or come on active duty. He chose to go and take the basic and advanced training and, and get his wings, and then you know the rest of the story. I was fortunate to serve with him in Korea as well. He was in the 12th Tactical Fighter Squadron, and, and I was in the uh, 67th. And we both served our 100 missions in Korea at the same time. He came back. He was finishing in a tour in the Philippines, and I had just gotten over there, so he came back to the States after his Korean flying, and, and I went back to the Philippines. But uh, Chappie, of course, you know the story, great all-around man, and that's what made him and allowed him to move on up. Great speaker. He could speak in the high-level boardrooms or down on the waterfront. Uh, quite a guy, and certainly made a name for himself and stood tall and, of course, became the first black four-star general. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, let me just make a couple of comments. Back in 1946, uh, there were five of us who were selected to go to the Central Instrument Instructor School, which was uh, uh, a fantastic school. And those five people, one was Colonel McGee, I mean, who was Captain McGee at that time, and there were four first lieutenants. There was a guy by the name of Harold Brown, a lieutenant. There was a Wilden Groves, a Roland Bylon, and then there was another first lieutenant who was Chappie James. And uh, that's when I first met Chappie James. But it was kind of interesting to have been there in school with him and then to see how Chappie rose through the ranks to become the first four-star general. Well, I've come upon that question from Dr. Uh, Jones from Harlan, Dr. Texas, uh, and, uh, particularly to Colonel McGee. Uh, Dr. Jones apparently served in uh, Vietnam at the time you were there, and he asks, what kind of aircraft did you fly in the Vietnam conflict? The Vietnam conflict, I flew the uh, RF-4C, the reconnaissance version of the F-4. No weapons, speed was our defense. Fantastic. Hello. And then a general question uh, about uh, your impressions of uh, General Benjamin O. In what ways did he shape the attitudes and the behavior of the airmen? This question from Barbara Gaffer. 
Well, I can say from the early days when he uh, took command of the 332nd Fighter Group, we certainly all respected him for what he had been through, and uh, uh, we, we also respected because most of us at that time were reserve officers, and he was a regular officer, stood tall, straight as an arrow, uh, very stern in a way, very demanding, somebody we respected, and that respect lasted a lifetime, really, uh, with, with, with him. I, my own experience, I would almost say he wasn't an easy person to get to know, but certainly respect was the highest from the very beginning. Uh, the only comment I would make is that uh, uh, Colonel Davis did a fantastic job of really preparing us for integration. Uh, he was strict strictly military. I can remember when I came overseas, he came in as he normally did. He greeted us. We're happy to have you within the organization. And then he went on to say, let me tell you what your primary duty is. Your primary duty is to protect these bombers, to get them over target, get them back home safe and sound so they can fly another day. You don't win a war by shooting down a few aircraft. And he said, and I'll tell you now, if you ever leave the bombers to go over looking for personal victories, he said, you can shoot down 10, and you come back here, I'll court-martial you. So with that very, very strict attitude, there was no question in your mind what your responsibility was. We were there to escort the bombers to get them over the bomb target and to get them home safely. That was our duty and that was our primary responsibility. You react to fighters only in those cases in which an attack by a fighter was imminent and they were going after a bomber. Then you engage those fighters to prevent that from happening. But with that very, very strict military of his, for the uh, years that we served overseas and came back and served at Lockburn, when integration time came in 1949, uh, we were as ready as anyone uh, to accept that new responsibility. Very, very impressive. Fully agree. He was a great leader for us in that time and stage, and uh, the results showed. We have another question from Maxine Walker Giddings asking, did you personally, uh, did any of the airmen, as you personally observed, lose any of the bombers that they were escorting? I'm not aware of it during my time frame there to say that from, uh, from the escort work we started in uh, April of 44. I came home late November 44. I'm not aware of it because uh, we believed what Colonel Davis said, and he was a man of his word. Uh, so uh, I'm not aware of anybody trying to deviate from his guidance. Oh, for myself on all 30 missions, I cannot recall uh, a bomber being shot down due to enemy aircraft engagement. Uh, granted, uh, they, they did find out that it was the case that there were missions in which bombers were lost, but uh, from my recollection, uh, it never happened uh, on any of the missions that I was on. Well, I think in my case, uh, when you look at all of the mission reports in the, from the beginning to the end of the mission, uh, there were some losses, but exactly where, when, who were they? stragglers, were they with the bomb formation? Sometimes planes uh, got out of formation. There are just so many things, but uh, yes, there were some losses during my time frame, but uh, our record compared to others is still very creditable. We have a question from Indianapolis, Indiana, from Tom Berry. Uh, his question is, how many Tuskegee pedigreed C-51s are still remaining today. Do you gentlemen know of any? I'm personally not aware of any that uh, served as Tuskegee Airmen 
aircraft, and uh, would love to hear if you know of any. I'm not aware of any. In fact, mm -hmm. I have heard that uh, they scrapped most of the aircraft when the group uh, was stood down and, and left the theater. Exactly what they happened, I don't know, or where they gave some of the South American countries. Uh, there's only a couple of uh, the C models flying today, but none of them trace their history to having been overseas. In fact, I don't know how many of the 51s flying here in the country now, if any of them came from overseas. I'm not aware. <laughs> no, neither am I. And that's one of the tragedies that um, inspired the, uh, the founders of the Commemorative Air Force to begin preserving these aircraft. As, as you gentlemen know, the CAF is a dedicated group of volunteers operating all around the United States and in several other countries. Um, restoring and preserving in the flying condition the aircraft of World War II and beyond. And we're, we're very proud that we've had the, the tremendous support of a number of key volunteers and other organizations in getting the Red Tail Mustang going. And um, it's an honor to serve with you. And uh, in the three minutes remaining during our allotted, uh, our allotted program, I'd like to invite those of you who are able to stay on for a few additional minutes for more bonus questions and uh, answers. And if uh, our special guests, Colonel Charles McGee and Colonel Harold Brown, can remain on the air, we would love to have you comment further. And a uh, question coming in from Scott Morrill asks, if either of you know Colonel Luke Weathers of Memphis. Colonel Brown, are you aware of uh, Colonel Luke Weathers from Memphis? Oh, yes. Yes, I, uh, yes, I uh, did know uh, uh, Luke Weathers. I, I, was, I was waiting for, uh, for Colonel McGee to respond because uh, 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 Luke Weathers and Dan Colonel McGee uh, uh, were when went over with the original uh, 332nd uh, fighter group. So uh, he would probably uh, know a heck of a lot more about him than I. But I most certainly knew him, and um, I never flew in the same squadron with him. But I certainly knew uh, uh, Luke. Colonel McGee, did you serve with Colonel Weathers in any combat roles? Yes, we probably, if we shared our flight logs, we'd find we were probably on several missions, and a couple of my rest camp visits, we were there at the same time. So I got to know Luke and uh, uh, was pleased to have been able to share with his family as they recently interred him at Arlington National Cemetery. Although back here in the States, our paths didn't cross that much, but we did have periodic contact. And that's one of the things that, that training together, combat together, and post-combat period gave us lifelong friendships. Wonderful. Wonderful. And just to wrap up, uh, official first 45 minutes of this program, before we uh, continue on to the unofficial addendum here, we have a very good question coming from from uh, Gurney, Illinois, asking, where were you when you heard the war was over, and uh, what was it like returning to the United States after World War II? Colonel McGee? Yes. Well, Harold, you were over there when it ended, weren't you? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I was in Mooseburg, uh, POW camp about 30 miles, 30 nautical miles, uh, not 30 miles, 30 kilometers north of Munich uh, when Patton came through and liberated us on April of uh, April 29th of 1945. And then the war ended just about four or five days later and that on about May the 4th or, or, or 5th. But as far as I was concerned, once I was liberated, the war was over as far as I was concerned. But it officially ended, like I said, about four or five days uh, days later. And uh, and we knew that, even in POW camp, we knew that it was going to be over soon. Uh, we knew the Americans were getting closer and closer. Uh, even, even some of the guards that were there guarding us was telling us, well, within a short while, you guys are all going to be 
liberated and uh, the war is going to end and about two hours or so before Patton uh, knocked down the wire fences and whatnot, uh, the guards all got in formation and kind of waved to us goodbye as they marched all out of the uh, out of the POW camp uh, since uh, Patton would be there and his arrival was imminent and he was no more than just an hour or so away and they just left left the prison camp. So uh, that was my uh, you know feeling. Here it is. The war was over for me at that time and uh, was I elated, happy, tickled to death. I was now going to get a decent meal. <laughs> My case, I had come home and uh, had become a twin engine instructor down at Tuskegee, and of course uh, we were training pilots that were going to go join units going to the Pacific. So the war ended, but uh, we didn't celebrate or stand down. Training continued, so it was a happenstance that you read in the paper, but our work went on. Fantastic. We have a really astute question from nine-year-old Matthew from Greenwood, Indiana, who wants to know what sort of formations you flew to escort the bombers, and what was that experience like? I'm curious myself, seeing the depictions in the film of these incredible, just vast numbers of aircraft, can you tell us a little bit about the typical bomber escort mission and how many fighter escorts were involved and how many bombers you typically protected? Okay. Let me start, and Harold, you pick up, because I think you okay. changed a bit. In the early days, each squadron put up 16 aircraft. Well, we put up 18, two were spares. If everybody else was moving along okay after 15 or 20 minutes off, they would re the spares would return. But we put up 16 aircraft, um, and uh, the squadrons are escort varied. Sometimes we had what is called penetration escort, sometimes we carried the full mission, sometimes we had egress escort. So it depended on the length of time and how many bomb groups were, were involved. I think each bomb squadron put up 12 aircraft. They didn't have as many aircraft as the fighter squadrons had per, per unit. Uh, but there were a lot of aircraft in the air uh, and generally, we flew out to the side uh, with the three squadrons and later four squadrons. We'd have some above the bombers, some out to the side, maybe sometimes one just below the, the, the bombers. But that, that's the way it was in the early uh, days of the escorting. And uh, I think it depends on the target, how many bomb squadrons or, or bomb groups might be involved in the same uh, raid. They could have the groups going to different locations for, rather than close the oil fields, Regan, Bird chemical plants, of course in late in the war even all the way to Berlin. But Harold, you may have done a little differently in your time frame. Yeah, yeah. Well, ours is quite similar. Uh, you know, we would go out uh, with the bombing group uh, we could hear them go over Ramatelli on their way. We would take off an hour, hour and a half later, and we would pick them up at wherever the rendezvous point was uh, just, be, be just before they were going over the bomb line and entering into enemy territory. And, uh, and, if we had, uh, and if we had the whole group that was going to give protection to two or three wings of bombers, uh, you usually had a had the lead squadron was probably up high, up in the lead front. You have one on the left, a squadron on the left flank, high or low. You have one over on the right flank, high or low, and probably one trailing behind. So the bombers were 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 well protected, and there were airplanes, pretty much fighters, surrounding all all those bombers. And of course, uh, as you got closer and closer to the target, you had your head on a swivel, you know, watching the horizons and whatnot, uh, just to make certain that there were no surprise attacks. And uh, that was it. And there were days that you would see enemy fighters sitting out there. They were not engaged. They would go in over the target. And uh, if there were any casualties, it would be the flak over the target. They would come back. We would normally circle 
around the target. They would come off a target. And when they came off, they were a little raggedy because of all the fact they had gone through. And that is when they were the very most vulnerable is when they came off a target. Because uh, guys had engines out and whatnot and was hollering for fighter protection and uh, and all this sort of stuff. Uh, but uh, but that was it. And uh, and if it was the case that we would take a men target and take them on withdrawal, then we would stick right with them until we could get them back over the bomb line, you know, back home uh, before we would break off with them. We're going to take time for just a couple of more questions here before we wrap up with respect to the uh, the time constraints that our special guests are encountering today. And that's our gratitude to them. One question from Jason Proctor says, my grandpa was a Tuskegee Airman. And I want to know whether the movie was accurate when it showed them watching films of their combat actions. Did they have cameras in their planes? Colonel McGee? Yes. Uh, there were cases where uh, certain of the actions, uh, we had a chance to look at the uh, film and see. Most of the time, that was individual rather than as a group. Though in, in my case, because uh, there, we all had some extra duty, so once we got through intelligence briefing, uh, you may look at film during your intelligence briefing as they recap the mission, what was accomplished and what was seen and that type of thing. Uh, we, I don't recall a, a big whole group uh, uh, or a squadron gathering to look at a, at a particular film, but those that were free certainly had the opportunity to sit in and see somebody else's film during their debriefing. And Colonel Brown, Colonel Brown. yes, I there 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 isn't much more that I can add, you know, you know, to it. Uh, uh, you had your cameras there. And there were several positions, guns, guns, guns and cameras, uh, or else guns only. And of course, you always went to the guns and camera position uh, so that whenever you were shooting, uh, your cameras were right there on it, uh, you know, to confirm uh, whatever it was that you were shooting at. Uh, but uh, that was just about it. Very, very interesting. We got a. Uh Another question from uh, Winnipeg asking if the, the scenes with the ME-262 jet aircraft were realistic. Uh, can either of you comment on what happened to encounter the jets that the Germans put in the air? Uh, was that a realistic representation of the number of jets that were encountered on a mission? Uh, uh, you want to go? I'll, or? Speak first because during, uh, I'll speak first because during my time frame, I. We did not encounter any of the German jets put up. Um, they were put up in the defense of, of the Berlin and that area late in the war. So, Harold, I don't. You you probably had some comment there. Yeah. Uh, I only I only ran into the ME two sixty two on on two flights, and uh, uh, one was uh, oh one was a mission in. In early in early December, uh, it was December the twelfth. In in fact, uh, and uh, it was the first time that we actually encountered the you know, ME two sixty twos. And I was in the lead flight, and Major Camel, who was our 99th uh, squadron commander, he was uh, he was leading the squadron that day. And I can recall so well, uh, they would just kind of dance out there. And sometimes they would come in, and sometimes they wouldn't. But this particular day, they did come in. And I can recall when myself and a wing man, uh, we peeled off on one of the 262s. And interesting enough, uh, as, as we were going down, we were going almost straight down. And while they were going straight down, granted, they had a heck of a speed advantage on us. And I often thought, why in the world would you even dive to even let us even, even get close to you? Because their because straight and level speed 
even though they were subsonic with a very thick wing, and they, they were not supersonic aircraft, they were strictly subsonic, but their speed in straight level flight was just as great as their speed if, if they went into a dive. But they would go into a dive, you would go down with them, and though our speed wasn't quite as close to them, the separation distance wasn't that excessive because we would actually pick up greater speed. And once they go level, they were still going at the exact same speed and they would immediately separate themselves from us. So there's only a couple of occasions that I did see them, and, uh, but didn't even get close to them. Fantastic conversation, amazing history, and it is an honor and a pleasure to have you both uh, participate in this so that the people who sign in for these incredible broadcasts can hear it in your own words. With that, we're going to bring to a close today's session, and thank you both very kindly for being a part of it. We're extremely grateful. We still have dozens of questions that we hope to get to. Uh, we're going to ask the production team in Virginia if they can copy those questions and, and save them for our next two uh, scheduled events, February 9th and February 12th. And we invite you all to join us again, and please spread the word among the schools in your communities to get the school kids in on this. This is real history from the people who created it, the people who lived it, and the people who can tell it no one, no one else can. can. On behalf of the audience and uh, the viewers and uh, the rest of the volunteers from the Commemorative Air Force Red Tail Squadron, Colonel McGee and Colonel Brown, we thank you for your service and for your participation in these events. On behalf of the Commemorative Air Force, a nationwide group of volunteers dedicated to preserving this incredible history, I'm your moderator, Stan Ross. We invite you to join us again, and thank you for being here today.